everyone. Colleagues. <laughs> Colleagues, friends and guests, on behalf of the Department of Materials, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this special event here this evening. And uh, my primary role this evening is to give the fire briefing. Uh, so I can tell you that there are no uh, drills planned. So if the alarm should sound, then please make your way through the exits, either at the rear of the room or to the side here, uh, outside again. And the assembly point is on Exhibition Road. Now, as I was just looking at the abstract for this evening's lecture, uh, I noticed that the color blue featured, and it occurred to me that the color blue is sometimes associated with the cold, uh, with low mood, and depending upon your age, possibly with an English boy band that represented the UK in the 2011 Eurovision Song Contest. And I think that's what Sandrine was alluding to when she referenced groundbreaking music in the abstract for her talk. Anyway, I can think of nothing less appropriate, therefore, for an occasion such as this, when we gather to celebrate the outstanding achievements of one of our new professors, and particularly one of our colleagues who is so warm and who does so much to raise the spirits of everybody in the department. So I look forward this evening to being corrected about my misconceptions about the color blue uh, and hearing a positive vision for a bright blue world. So I'm delighted to introduce to you Professor Sandrine Hoyts. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for this um, great introduction and very kind introduction too. Um, so this was your slide. <laughs> this is mine. So, um, I'm uh, so delighted uh, to, to, to be here today, and uh, I'm even more delighted that, that you're here and that I'm um, able to, to, to share today um, some of the work um, that, that we've done and with uh, my colleagues, uh, my students, past uh, and present, with my family, uh, my colleagues, um, and, and, and a lot of friends as well. So, um, yes, I did choose the, the, the color blue. It's going to be a theme running through my presentation. Of course, it's not, it's not difficult. Uh, we live in a, on the blue planet, so it is a blue world. In terms of brightness, no, I didn't take any references from, um, from British culture, but rather from some um, famous Belgians. They should be mentioned. Um, there are blue as well, because blue is the color of calm and joy and blue sky thinking as well. Um, I will talk a little bit about art too, because blue has been uh, very much associated with uh, changes in, in, in paint, and actually my talk will be about uh, pigments. And going to science, blue, of course, there have been uh, breakthroughs in, in science, even as recently as 2014, which was awarded to the invention of the blue LED. And here is Nakamura uh, showing us the blue LED in 2014. Blue is also associated with the very best of computing. And this is here, Deep Blue, the first computer to beat um, a chess champion, so Kasparov in this case, in 1997. So blue is associated to groundbreaking science too. So to understand blue, let's go back through the ages and understand the origin of, of, of blue and its interaction with humankind. So here we can trace back to ancient Egypt where lapis lazuli was the pigment of choice to create the color blue. Um, it was extremely difficult to procure because it came from Afghanistan and in the art it had to be ground in order to create the color onto the artwork. So very expensive. There were alternatives in the natural world uh, coming from plants and this is wood which was in Europe and indigo which was rather in, in Asia. Uh, this 
was uh, giving a good color, but w through means that were not necessarily very refined, and therefore it was the blue, like the status of blue decreased slightly through the ages compared to the big prominence it had in ancient Egypt. But blue made a comeback in uh, the 1200s through um, its, its advent in, for example, glass. And here uh, is an example, one of the earliest examples of, of blue in glass, glass staining uh, from the uh, Chartres Cathedral. Um, in the early 1200s. Since then, blue has really been associated with uh, richness, with, uh, with uh, you know, wealth of spirit, and it was associated with the Virgin Mary. So it was a lot of, uh, you know, a lo lot of interest in blue, but still it was coming from natural pigments. And this is one of, uh, uh, one of the, 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 the final examples of using natural blue, again, from ground pigments, uh, that uh, come from lapis lazuli on, or aquamarine. In this case, the girl with the pearl earring from Vermeer. If we look at the material science and the chemistry from those materials, so here uh, there will be some chemistry in my talk. I will try to keep it accessible. Um, but actually, the origin of blue in all of these materials is very different. So in um, the lapis lazuli and in, in, in it's, it's in aquamarine, which was used in the turban over there, it was this, this group S3 minus, um, and it was the transition of this minus, this electron, which was giving the color blue. In the case of uh, the, the stained windows, it was cobalt, cobalt 2 plus. Again, you see a charge there, so you've got three electrons that are able to jump to a higher level, and that is leading to absorption of certain wavelengths that will lead other, um, uh, that will leave the color blue on the stained windows. In indigo, however, the story is completely different and, and you don't have any of those free electrons. What you have instead is uh, these, you see these double bonds now. These double bonds are able to travel all around the molecule and be what we call delocalized, and I will go into more details about this later. Um, and, and, and this means that there is an electron cloud that can also get excited to a high level and create this color blue. So very different origins. And actually, we'll be talking about cobalt, but we'll also be talking about this delocalized electrons. They can give the color blue separately, but also uh, in conjunction. So if we now go to the artificial blue, again back to ancient Egypt, because this was the first time that blue was, uh, was, was created artificially. In this case, mainly due to the presence of copper, again, in the two plus state. Uh, the, the blue is a little bit more faint, so this uh, was not actually uh, a very stable blue. I should say also that in this case, we have um, a solid that is creating the color blue, so it's a pigment, whereas in the case of indigo, it was a dye, so it's, it was the molecule just in, in isolation that was giving the color blue. Um, the second example of, of artificial blue, so basically there was, a, there, there was a period in between this artwork and this artwork, uh, which you might recognize from Japanese art, the great wave, um, where, where there was no artificial blue. So the recipe has been lost. Prussian blue then came to the fore. And it's an extremely interesting material. So it gives a, a, a really lovely uh, shade of blue. And its, it's structure is um, it's very simple. So it's all cubic. And you've got iron in the three plus state and iron in the two plus state, and again, that means that you've got these plus states that can um, absorb electrons, but in this case, it's written slightly differently. So you've got two species and the electrons, instead of going to an excited state, uh, they, they shuttle in between those two irons, and this is what creates the color blue. The, the, the presence of iron also suggests something that I want to come to, which is magnetism. And uh, this will go through my um, talk here. So I was going to try and be brave and give you a little demo. I'm not sure it's going to work. But <laughs> since we are talking about uh, paintings, why not? <laughs> so here are a few paintings. And we've got, first of all, Prussian blue here. 
which um, has had a, a rich history already in, in, the, um, in, in the atelier of, of one of my friends, good friends, Thomas Lyle, who was kind enough to, um, to, to lend it to me. And so um, what we're going to do now for the rest of the lecture is, uh, <laughs> you see where this is going? <laughs> Watch paint dry. <laughs> okay, so I will smear some of it on here. Or you'll watch me letting paint dry as well. It's, it's always very difficult to get the right amount, especially in these conditions. So here we go. It's, and then you can get an appreciation for this, sorry, also for the lecture. And we will be, I'm not shaking at all. <laughs> it's great. I'm not going to be able to do this. I did ask, oh God, I did ask for blue tag. Okay, well, maybe, maybe it will be interesting if it stays like that. Okay, um, let's have a look. Is this paint actually magnetic? So I have a great big magnet over here and I cross my finger. Yes, you see how it's moving, I hope you see. Yes. So, this paint is magnetic. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> uh, now, let's get back to my <coughs> presentation. Great. This is the easy one. So, uh, Prussian blue, great pigment. Uh, it's, it, it works in artwork. It's not uh, so easy to upscale. It's also very useful in medicine, for example. So uh, actually, car paint might be a, a, a question you've got. This is, this is our car, unfortunately not our house. Um, <laughs> and and it's, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's a brilliant blue. So what's in this blue? Well, we have this uh, molecule, which is not Prussian blue. This is actually monastral blue. I knew there had to be a mistake somewhere in my presentation. It's called monastral blue. And uh, the reason why I don't care so much about this is actually we will be talking about, uh, about its chemical name, uh, copper phthalocyanine. So the phthalocyanine is this ring around the molecule, which you see again, this alternating single double bonds that we had in the indigo too. It's got a copper at the center, but this copper in, in the case of color, doesn't really have a big role to play. Uh, but it's got some really other interesting properties which I will get to. Uh, thalocyanine is, is, is really a, an exciting molecule because it's strongly associated with one of the greats of Imperial College, Sir Patrick Linstead, who was the rector of Imperial College in 1954 up until 1966. And uh, just like me, he liked thalocyanine so much that in this painting that is hanging in, in 170 Prince's Gate that some of you might have seen already, there is a thalocyanine that is, has not been photoshopped in. This is the genuine uh, painting of, of Sir Patrick Linstead, who, who did really um, uh, discover or rediscover, actually control the synthesis of the thalocyanine in 1933. So that was a really big milestone. This, uh, th this, this, this Prussian, <coughs> this um, monastral blue, this copper thalocyanine, is, uh, is at the basis of most artificial pigments that we will see um, uh, around us, especially in industrial applications such as um, car paint. Um, now, let's try to understand this molecule and its, and, and, and its relevance. So it's, it's, it's very stable, uh, hence you know, car paint, but we can also play around with uh, the central ion. So it, it always needs to be in the two plus state. So it needs to lose two electrons in order to be accommodated in this ring. And you could, for example, replace it with magnesium. You could also lose the red rings, uh, the nitrogen, sorry, that are bridging there, and lose the rings too. Then you end up with something that is called a porphyrin. And if you add a few bits there um, to make it soluble, then you end up with a chlorophyll. And a chlorophyll is, as you know, at the basis of, um, of, of, of phenomena such as photosynthesis. 
So, so this is basically a, 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 a very long introduction to tell you I enjoy the color blue. <laughs> but actually, in terms of my career, this is not what I set out to do. What I really enjoyed is uh, very big machines and steel. And um, this is um, Hoyt's Homburg house it. Uh, Hoyt's, like me, like my grandfather over here. Hamburg, Hamburg, like my grandmother over there, and house it, where the company is actually based. So this was really my motivation, one of my motivations to, to choose uh, my, my research career. The other one is a wonderful time that I had when I was at the University of Liège. And this is a group photo of uh, Supra. And you might recognize later on that Rudy Klutz is here, and I'm uh, sitting at his knees as well. Which, uh, uh, and it was an absolutely uh, great, uh, great experience to work there, and super high like for superconductors. So we were interested in magnetism already back then. So this all led me to come to London with Professor Tim Jones here at Imperial College in the chemistry department, because also he does like stainless steel, and this seemed like a, 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 great, uh, a great combination. I also spent some time in Germany here with Professor San and uh, Professor Giorgetta Salvan, who, of course, also like steel. So the reason I like steel is because of these great big machines, but also because I'm really interested in surface science, and this was uh, what I was after. So I came to Tim Jones, and I got loads of stainless steel. So this is the first chamber um, that, uh, that we built. And this is where the thalassinine comes in. So because the thalassinine has these alternating single double bonds, it's very, very stable. And so you can heat it up in the vacuum that is created there. The, 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 the steel is needed because you're going to uh, create a, a, a vacuum environment. So you're going to pump all the air out, heat up this material, and this material is going to go in the vapor phase. Vapor phase, well, gas phase, rather, sorry. Um, and so thank you to my students for this wonderful animation which shows you how these bonds are delocalized. So instead of, of, of any of those bonds being vulnerable, all of them are stabilized by this delocalization. This delocalization, of course, means um, also that, that you can have charge conduction going through your material too, which is going to come, uh, come in later. And you can imagine that in the processes such as photosynthesis, this this, uh, the, the, this, the, the principle of absorbing sunlight and creating charges um, is key. And so these uh, rotation of bonds and this ability of, of electrons to move around the molecule is key as well. So um, what I really wanted to do, I told you I really wanted to do surface science. Um, and I wanted to do scanning tunneling microscopy, which allows you uh, to view individual atoms. So, STM, as it was called, was very big in the 90s, and here is an example to give you uh, a, an idea of, of, of IBM researchers in IBM, Don Eigler uh, in particular, who were able to not only visualize individual atoms, so each of those bum bumps there are individual atoms, uh, but also they were able to uh, place them around um, and, and create the logo IBM um, who are the, the, where they were working at. So thalassinine could also be studied by STM. And this is one of the early examples of those thalassinines. Now, in this case, we've got one nanometer. So the distance that your nail is going to grow in one second is basically what we are able to image over here. And you recognize this sort of clove-like clove uh, structure. So unfortunately, I did not uh, end up doing any STM during my PhD. Um, or during my postdoc. Uh, my, I started my PhD in uh, 1998, but fortunately, actually, 17 years later, finally, we got an STM image um, through a collaboration with, uh, with, with Tim Jones rather than, uh, than, than me as a student, and with, uh, with two of our, well, one of my students, um, uh, Alex Ramadan, and one of his students, Luke Rochford, and, and you know, very nice images here of iron phthalocyanines uh, uh, were able to be, to be seen. But this is not my, so of course I had to deviate slightly. 
Um, and so what I really worked on, instead of looking at individual molecules, was looking at crystals of those molecules. So we're now looking at um, the, the solid state. We're looking at um, different ways in which you can grow those materials. So you can grow them at high temperature, and then you get these nice crystals, or you can grow them at room temperature and to form those films. And these are images here on the nanometer scale again, where you can see the morphology of those films. What we were really interested in was the structures that were quite different. And you can see that you can shift the molecules re with respect to one another. And so if I um, take my visualizer again, really what we're doing in this process is we've got two molecules, one on top of the other. And depending on how we process them in vacuum, we can shift them either in this direction or in that direction. The center there, the red dot, is the metal. And as you can imagine, the interactions of these metals will be slightly different depending on the structure. So, also, the colors are very different, so the, you can see uh, in the solid state here, purple, and in this case, nice and blue. And you can go from one to the other simply by changing the sizes and also by changing the structure. So I spent a long time actually trying to control these different phases, the high temperature phase, the beta, the low temperature phase, the alpha. Um, and afterwards, we thought, let's make something useful out of it. These, uh, this is here the structure of a solar cell. And as we've seen before, the phthalocyanins are very similar to the chlorophylls. Therefore, they should absorb light effectively. And this is creating something that we call an exciton, an excited state, that is going to be separated when it's near a molecule that really likes electrons, such as the buckyball here, the C60. Then this excited state is going to separate into an electron and a hole and form a circuit and generate electricity. So the phthalocyanins like to lie perpendicular on a substrate. So this is now the side view of the phthalocyanins, these great big plates with the metal at the center. When you've got an electron, so what we're interested in is, is in this process of, of extracting electrons, this electron likes to hop from molecule to molecule. This is how it goes through your device. Now, you can imagine that in this configuration, basically the electron's gonna go here parallel to the electrode, so not gonna be extracted from your device, which is not very useful for a solar cell. So we spent a long time actually finding ways in which we could control this molecule to be lying flat on a substrate, and this is together also with Paul Sullivan, who joined later, um, and we use this magic molecule here, PTCDA, in order to promote this change in orientation. This had relatively big impact for solar cells, and here you've got current versus voltage. You can imagine that you want a lot of current and a lot of voltage out of your device. And when we go from a configuration where the molecules are perpendicular in blue to one where they are parallel, uh, over here in red, you get more current out of your device. So we, we won, we're very pleased about this. I should say that CUPC, we were not the first ones to use the thalassinins in those devices, but um, this, this change in orientation was really a, a, a big advance that, that, we, that we brought forward. So that was the, one of the themes. And um, really, I think we can say that there was revolution in the windows in the 1200s um, thanks to the introduction of, of cobalt, but we could now make the windows functional and think about coating those windows with molecules in order to create electricity and um, uh, you know, create solar cells on our windows. And this is an example from a PFL in, in Lausanne, uh, which are coated with solar cells. Um, they are not actually um, uh, based on, the, on, on, on organic molecules. They are based uh, on disensitized solar cells, but you, you get the idea. Um, the solar cells based on molecules, are, some examples are over here. 
The great advantages that we've got is that they're flexible, and so they can be put on bags, um, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully we will see some revolution in green energy uh, in the way that we prepare, that we use those, those materials. So solar cells was one way in which blue materials can uh, hopefully create a greener world because there is no question, and I don't have any stats here, but I think we all agree that uh, we do need renewable energies and this would be a great way to achieve them. Then the next step, again, is about this molecule over here, um, but it was uh, through a Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Fellowship that I got the chance to study molecular magnetic biosensors, so another aspect of those molecules. Here we are actually considering that this, um, this free electron actually has a spin and behaves like a magnet, pointing up, pointing down. These spins could be used in computing to be like a bit of information. We also had plans to, or I had plans to, to uh, have another system that was going away from stainless steel and where I was going to be able to create those materials um, in a glass furnace, but I never really got to that and uh, uh, I got back to stainless steel. So this didn't really work out, but uh, maybe not too bad. So I did this um, fellowship at UCL and at the London Centre for Nanotechnology, which at the time was only an artist's impression. So <laughs> I, had a, I had great times um, somewhere in the, the, the offices next to Heels, which was a very nice area to shop at, um, not so much to set up a lamp, which is maybe the reason why I didn't go all the way in building this and I rather stepped to stainless steel. Straight away, I uh, got very much included with some wonderful people, um, Marshall Stoneham and Gabriel Epley, um, who had a, a, a great big grant, um, quantum technologies, putting the quantum into information technology. And so they were very interested in uh, the materials um, that I was studying. And the, the, the main reason for it is that Marshall had this scheme where um, you were going to be able to do quantum computing with three atoms. So why is this important? Why is this groundbreaking? Well, computing is still very much based on the transistor. And you can see here the image of the first transistor built by Bell Lab. It's really big. It relies on a gate voltage to control the amount of current that goes between a source and a drain. And you can miniaturize this, but you can't go much lower than 10 nanometers, something like that. Otherwise, things get too hot and uh, basically you're stuck. But you will have noticed that your computers have shrunk with time, right? So, um, and they continue to shrink and we expect them to continue to shrink according to something called Moore's law. So something here needs to change. Um, and so this idea here that we'll have two atoms, A and B, that are much closer together than nine nanometers, that are going to be controlled by the state of another atom, C, which again is very close to them. The atom, C, is going to be controlled optically, i.e. going from this ground state to one of those excited states, like I was telling you about in the solar cell scheme. It is actually pretty groundbreaking for miniaturization, but also for the energy cost that's involved in computing. Again, we are all expecting to uh, use ICT in devices more and more. And these are some projections from last year, which, uh, which calculated in a relatively conservative way that 20% of our energy consumption would be coming from devices, ICT, the cloud computing, etc. So we really desperately need to find ways to do computing more effectively. And um, instead of controlling voltages in order to, uh, to get yes or no in a transistor, if we use just photon, if we use just light, we could save a lot of energy um, uh, also to do computing. So, so these, back in 2003, were, were, were pretty great ideas. And so they included me in, in, in their efforts um, in quantum computing. 
Um, unfortunately, the, the, these atoms were actually dopants in silicon, so they were not really interested in my beautiful molecules over here, and they were interested in the central metal ion and in the fact that I was able to deposit those films in different way, either perpendicular, forming nice chains in this way, or flat on the substrate. And so Jules was my first student that um, I got at UCL, and her job was to basically destroy this with a UV light so that we could dope them into silicon. So, uh, so, so this worked quite well. We didn't do any quantum computing, but we were able to destroy a lot of molecules. <laughs> <laughs> it continued um, with some other very talented students, Leo, Jasper, and Ryan, and, and, and they exploited the fact that actually, yeah, you see the blue is di disappearing with time uh, following UV radiation, but what you end up with is an oxide, and oxides are also very interesting. Uh, actually, having them not blue and transparent is, is an advantage if you want to make a transparent electrode, for example, which would be the case of doped zinc oxide, for example. So this was one of the things that, that, that got me into these quantum materials, but uh, it, it is a little bit sad to destroy such molecules. So what we rather did was to utilize the molecules as well in conjunction, so they got interested in the molecules after all. Um, this is what I showed you already before. There are transition metals in there. These transition metals can be magnetic. Let's look at the periodic table, always a fun thing to do, even for teenagers, especially for teenagers. Um, so looking at transition metals here, we see that there are a number of electrons there. We increase by one as we go along this row. We're interested in the, the, the shell electrons, the D electrons. So there are 10 D electrons maximum, so they can be put into five levels. I'll take this as the most simplified way to um, look at those levels with the energy increasing as we go up. So we've got, in this case, three that have the same energy and two that have another higher energy. So how do we fill those energy, how do we fill electrons in those energy levels? One at a time, and they like to take as much space as possible, and they like to be parallel. So that's the first three. Then we carry on, they can still fill, and then at some point they will need to pair up. Okay, so here we've got 10 electrons, easy enough. It seems easy, but if you've got six electrons, well, if we go back a step, and that's, that would be the configuration of iron. Uh, I'm, I'm taking here the two plus ions because they are what goes into my thalassinines. Okay, this is one configuration, but what happens now if the energy gap between those different sets of states is different? If it's bigger, then maybe the energy cost of going to occupy those levels is too high, and actually they will all pair up. And so we end up with all our magnets paired up and actually no net spin, no net up or no net down. So this material is what we would call diamagnetic, so no uh, free spin. But now if we change the configuration slightly, that can be because of the symmetry of the molecule, which is slightly different, um, and have two that have the same energy at the bottom and then two intermediate and one higher, well, we end up now with only two of those unpaired spins, where here we had four of those unpaired spins. So uh, even just looking at the transition metal, there are already quite a lot of complications here to understand what's going to be happening. So then think about what happens when we start putting them in a solid state with the great big ring around them um, and, uh, yeah, basically on the nanometer size. So, so that was quite tricky, but we did it. And this is now uh, a slightly technical uh, graph here where we've got magnetic susceptibility, susceptibility as a function of temperature. I won't go into the details of that, but this is CUPC. This, so this is, this is really the, the figure from, from our first paper on the subject. And um, you can see that in one phase, the spins are not oriented with respect to each other. And in the other phase, um, they are actually in the alpha phase, they are actually oriented with respect to each other. And so um, if, we, if we think about that, Let's do this. Um, if we go back to, to those molecules that I was mentioning um, before, now they've got a little magnet. 
Um, this, this can also go wrong, by the way, so wish me luck. <laughs> um, so both have a magnet. Um, and you see, if you change the structure, now the magnet is going to change. Let's just say it goes all the way around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they're back on top of one another, they have flipped. Yeah. So if we shift, then the molecule is quite uncomfortable in this orientation, and it's going to be flipping, whereas when we've got them on top, they like to be anti-parallel, which we call anti-ferromagnetic. So this is, this, is, this is great. I mean, actually, we didn't have this demo uh, back in 2007 when, when, when we did the work, and I, and I wish we had because it's, it's, it's a really compelling demo. Um, <laughs> but... Um, we, we needed to understand, and that's why um, those three people are, are up there. First, uh, Wei Wu and, and Andrew Fisher mainly uh, led the efforts on, on CUPC, uh, later to be complemented by, by uh, Nick Harrison as well. And so, so this is what they worked out here. It's not, not that easy. We need to understand um, the, the, the energy, like the... Uh, the molecular orbitals of, um, of those molecules, so we need to understand um, where the electrons are and then where those interactions occur. It's not just about simply the central magnet, because that would be direct exchange, as we call it. It's, it's, a, it's a much more complex mechanism, which goes via the organic rings, and which we call super exchange or indirect exchange. So great collaboration um, that, that started back then and that is still um, going strong. So um, this led to a little, you know, back to blue, Egyptian blue, Prussian blue, monastrol blue, and magnetic blue was um, therefore coined um, uh, thanks, to, thanks to this work. So let's just go back to here when we say that the phthalocyanin is going to be magnetic. We've got the humble, sorry, we have the humble paints again. This is indeed phthalocyanin blue um, that you can also get on Amazon. But. There we go. And maybe I need to get this to dry. I don't know if, if it's going to go up or down. Um, little rest for everyone, there we go. Okay, now this sort of works, just a tiny bit, tiny bit, you see? I'm not touching it, I promise. But uh, you see, it, it does move. So, so the phthalocyanine, because it's got this transition metal at the center, actually is uh, magnetic. I also have another one, which you might have noticed from my nails. Um, it's called Blue magnetic, magnetic blue. And um, yeah, I should actually uh, thank uh, Irina for, for working out what's, what, what's inside there. There is indeed copper because they are different. As I told you, uh, they are, they are, um, the color is due to the ring and not the, the inside transition metal ion. And therefore, um, it could also be a metal free phthalocyanin, but the popular one is the copper one, and so we've got copper in there that gets attracted um, by the magnet. Now, let's see what the blue magnetic is telling us. They, it, you know, it's a very promising name, and, and people really like to call things magnetic blue, but I think uh, it, it, it had its first outing um, uh, in, in, in that paper, which is great for the phthalocyanin. <laughs> this is not what I wanted. <laughs> okay, so magnetic blue is normally not magnetic. <laughs> this, I'm going to let this dry, and then we're going to try later. Okay, or oh, maybe we can do it like that. Does it work? Yeah. No, it, do it doesn't move. It doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I, I promise you that I'm a, a very conscientious scientist. I would not say it doesn't move if it, if it does move. 
and that would be usually a bit more convincing in my experiments. But anyway, <laughs> just to, to make you think about paints and, and the presence of, of, of transition metals. Uh, so this was great, we were really pleased. The problem though is that um, these materials were only displaying those wonderful properties at very, very low temperatures, two to 10 Kelvin. A Kelvin is a minus 273 um, well, zero Kelvin is, is minus 273 degrees Celsius, very, very cold, nothing moves anymore, it's the absolute zero. So this is very cold. <clears throat> so uh, interesting, the fact that we're able to change those, uh, those, those structures and get different magnetic properties, but uh, you know, we needed to work some more on this. And so if we take this starting point with the beta phase here, which is, <coughs> paramagnetic, no interaction, antiferromagnetic here. The reason for this, as we actually saw from these very nice um, orbitals, is that uh, the, the orbitals are actually in the plane, so the x squared minus y squared is what they're called, so they're in the plane. Now, if we move to uh, cobalt in the periodic table, then we've got uh, d7, and now the electrons are sticking out. The orbitals are sticking out, rather. Um, and in that case, you can see here from those um, simulations from the theory team, uh, Wei, Nick, and, and Andrew, um, that you know, the interaction appears to be stronger. We've got the same behavior of non-interacting and interacting, and this is work that was really led by Michele Seri, who's here, and uh, also Luke Fleet was involved. Um, now we've got a temperature that's much better. We've reached 100 Kelvin, that means that you can actually, just with liquid nitrogen, which has a boiling point of 77K, you can cool down your materials to get the magnetic behavior. We continued, looked at iron, because actually here we've got something that's antiferromagnetic, so overall the spins cancel. We would like to have a magnet, I'm not saying a fridge magnet, but you know, you never know, that could be really interesting. Uh, you can paint it on a you can paint it on a on, on, on a flexible substrate, and you've got a fridge magnet. So we wanted a system where they are parallel, and this can be achieved using iron. And this is really work led by Zenlin, who is also here, um, Solvay and Peter. And we're going down in temperature, but we do have this ferromagnetic <laughs> order. We've got also some really interesting physics in there. Um, where we've got solitrons as they're called, so domain walls in between those ferromagnetic uh, regions, which, which, which are you know, very interesting also in terms of propagation of information maybe, if we want to consider that each of those molecules is, um, is a bit of information. Okay, so we had some great systems. I told you what we would like to do though is to also use photons. Uh, one of the great uh, ideas that uh, Marshall Stoneham had back in 2003 and before, was that we could control the magnetic interactions with light. So we moved on to pentacene, which is another quite simple molecule, and you'll notice that it doesn't have any uh, transition metal at the center. Uh, fortunately, it's also blue um, when we grow it as a thin film, so, so that was lucky for my narrative. Um, no transition metal means that it's got paired spins in the ground state. So like I was mentioning you before, uh, there is no magnetic moment in there. So this was work led uh, by Daphne Lubert Perkel um, and also with contribution from Chris and Enrico and others. Um, so, so this magnetically is quite boring. But when we add a photon, we can get another state, an excited state. Again, quite boring because the spins are in opposite direction. Interesting, however, for solar cells because those could be separated again, like I mentioned earlier, into electron and hole with the adequate support around them. But what's very interesting about pentacene is that that spin quite readily can rotate. And in that case, it can be seen using uh, electron paramagnetic resonance, so you apply a magnetic field to it, and um, they will go in two different orientations. And uh, you see what we call a triplet, and this could be seen and used as a bit, maybe, of information. Now, this is an isolated molecule. If we put another one next to it, then pentathene uh, does something even more amazing. Even when that neighboring molecule is still in the ground state, not excited, we still have only one photon. This is one photon. 
Well, when those two find each other, they undergo what we call singlet fission. So this is nothing nuclear. It just means that the singlet that we had created by excita excitation by one photon is now giving us two excited states. So we get two for the price of one, which is pretty amazing. Again, we've got the EPR spectrum there that suggests that actually those two excited states talk to each other too. And the way in which they talk to each other will depend on the crystal structure. So this was, uh, this was a really interesting finding, even more so that this happens at room temperature. So we've uh, sort of got to the photo excited state and we also um, got rid of the low temperature. So, so that could be seen um, as a bit of a you know, high, high point. Uh, the, why, did we, why did we manage to do that? Um, well, and, and what was our strategy? The strategy was very much about, again, controlling thin film growth and orientation. Pentacenes um, like to uh, form really nice crystals, and this is the crystal structure of those materials over there. But we want to isolate those uh, states where you've got two neighboring molecules, and here there are just simply too many. And so um, we've uh, followed um, some strategies that were actually developed uh, uh, in, in materials and NPL um, with uh, Mark Oxborough, John Breeze, and, and Neil Alford, who did these works on single crystals, um, but you could do that in thin films as well. And so here we've got a turf phenyl here that is not gonna be excited, but it's gonna be separating um, those dimers um, from, uh, um, from, from its neighbors. It's also work that we had done back in um, 2000 and now I don't remember, eight, nine, um, with Din and Mark Warner and Sumaya Mothro amongst others with phthalocyanins too, where we were able to mix phthalocyanins with a spin and with no spins in order to really isolate um, uh, uh, molecular properties. And so really, I think this is, a, this is you know, the success of this is, is really a success of, of, of materials, um, which is why I'm you know, very happy to be where I am. Um, so this brings me to the end of my talk. I hope I've convinced you that uh, it is indeed a bright blue world and hopefully with uh, blue paint suitably engineered, uh, we will be able to address our uh, energy issues and also our computing issues, not issues, but just carry on um, getting uh, great um, uh, you know, advances technologically and environmentally. Uh, I should thank uh, a lot of people uh, and, oops, this has gone all a bit weird. Um, my group, first of all, so students uh, past and present, I've, I've tried to put the photos of, of, of all of them uh, as, uh, as they were involved in the research. Some of them, I'm sorry that your work didn't, didn't, quite, uh, didn't make it into the presentation, but also great work on, uh, on, on microscopy, on surface interactions, on different kinds of molecules, uh, and um, also uh, continuing the work on the bright blue molecular systems. Um, I would like to thank a lot of collaborators and mentors who've made some big, who've had a really big impact on uh, my scientific uh, career, but also on, on how I was uh, able to progress uh, sort of um, in, in the, the, the difficult situations sometimes uh, in, in academia uh, and see all of this as opportunities. So that was great. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my family who are here, uh, my, my mum, Christian, my sister, um, and my wonderful husband. I'd like, of course, to thank my kids. Uh, this is a, a photograph of the wooden spoon, which I quite often win um, for maybe not being super timely in, in some of the tasks I've got to do. Um, but I really uh, can't blame my children. Um, I have nothing but, uh, well, they have provided nothing but, but pride and inspiration to, to, to make me go forward. And so I thank them and I thank all of you for your attention. Okay, it's time for me to take the floor. So, sorry for my pronunciation. 
because uh, I stay in Belgium. I don't move to UK when I was young, so the pronunciation is not as, uh, as best as the pronunciation of Sandrine. Dear Sandrine, dear all, let me first introduce myself, especially for those of you who do, who do not know me yet. Okay, I am a chemist. My name is Rudy. You saw me on the picture, but it was taken 20 years uh, ago, so <laughs> I, I'm not sure that you will recognize me easily. Okay, I am a chemist, and since 1993, I have been teaching chemistry at the University of Liège, the cradle of our Sandrine, at that time still a continental girl. As far as I remember, at that time she was already a very ambitious girl. The least we can say is that she was not all terms, but I'm not sure now. <laughs> she chose me to supervise her graduation work and to guide her in her future choice. The apple never falls far from the tree. Good choice, Sandrine. <laughs> she worked on a fundamental project on EDX quantitative analysis in a scanning electron microscopy developing new methodology for getting reproducible, reliable results. I wrote at that time a letter of evaluation and I found it mentioning that Sandrine was, at that time, a hard-working person, knowledgeable, eager to learn, good at analyzing experimental findings, good at synthesis work, very sociable, calm, with good potential for teaching, and for directing work in the future. I also, yes, I also, <laughs> yes. I also found the last copy of her manuscript, this one. Blue was already present. <laughs> All of them, premonitory signs, no doubt. I fell in love at first sight. But Sandrine is not at all someone who has a geranium in the cranium. <laughs> Thus, I was very worried about losing her when soon she wanted to move to UK. She therefore embarked in a prospection in which I very modestly took part, taking her hand from time to time to reassure her even if very often, I was more anxious than she was, but she could not miss the boat. Finally, she decided to improve her skill in synthetic and analytical inorganic chemistry by applying for a postgraduate course at Imperial College in 2002, and she succeeded and wrote a very nice PhD thesis under the supervision of Professor Jones, not Indiana for me, but Tim. <laughs> No pain, no gain, and she raised the roof. Now we can say Elvis left the building. <laughs> then you know her better than me, I think. But let me comment a little bit on her inaugural lecture. You were saying that the color blue has long been associated with harmony, oceans, regal gowns, calm smurfs, groundbreaking music. I would like to add some other references, expression, especially, I hope, used in English. These are the following. Sandrine, you were, you still are my blue-eyed girl. <laughs> my favorite one. One of my chouchou in French. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With you, I have to say that nothing happens out of the blue. A long time ago, now, I tried to convince you to stay in Belgium to work with me until I was blue in the face. <laughs> I didn't succeed. And finally, what I experience today, considering all that we live together, only happens once in a blue moon. <laughs> I do not dream, you do not dream, you do not dream in blue, contrary to what the French song says, a very old French songs, Dream in Blue, sung by François Valéry and Sophie Marceau. I hope you know François Valéry and Sophie Marceau, but I'm not sure. It was in 1981. Quite fitting, quite fitting, since it is about a romance, an impossible romance, I would like to reassure René, between a teacher and a student, but at that time, obviously, not so studious than Sandrine. I would like to make some part of this song. 
dream in blue. Je rêve en bleu, I dream in blue. Tout est bleu, on is blue, blue, blue. Oh, dream in blue. I stop there, okay. <laughs> no, no. Let me finish my speech. I still have to thank the audience, you, the family, the friends, the students, wherever they come from, near or far, Sandrine's collaborators and mentors, and all of you who have taken the trip to attend this exceptional event. Many, many thanks also to Imperial College, the rector, I think, yes, yes, for offering its members such a nice opportunity. Tomorrow is another day. Let's enjoy doing what is tradition in such circumstance. Let's drink together. And raise the toast to Professor Sandrine Eutz. Thank you very much, Sandrine.